All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Ali. You might recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location, and I'm your host for this evening. I'm so excited to be introducing Eugene Linden and Dan Vergano here to discuss Eugene's new book, Fire and Flood. But before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. We are more and more having our events in person, which is so exciting, but our online event program is sticking around to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and of course for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So if you haven't gotten your hands on copies of any of the books that come up this evening and you would like to, I will be linking books in the chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in, grab a copy right off the shelf, or if you're um, not local or not leaving the house, we of course do ship, so go ahead and follow those links in chat to our website. And while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up this uh, spring, so if you would like to stay in touch with our community, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So tonight we are here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be um, either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in the chat, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. While you're in our chat and question spaces, I do want to remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. And finally, should any technical issues arise, um, which can happen in the world of Zoom, um, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them and we appreciate your patience and understanding. Alrighty, so now it's time for all of us to settle in, get comfy, because without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce Eugene Linden, award-winning journalist and author of nine books of nonfiction and one novel, including uh, The Winds of Change, which explored the connection between climate change and the rise and fall of civilizations, and was awarded the Grantham Prize Award of Special Merit. For many years, he wrote about nature and global environmental issues for time, where he garnered several awards, including the American Geophysical Union's Walter Sullivan Award. In conversation this evening, I'm so thrilled to welcome Dan Vergano, a science reporter with BuzzFeed News in Washington, D.C., where he covers science and politics. Uh, he was previously an editor and writer with National Geographic and a senior science reporter at USA Today. He has written and edited news stories about climate change for more than two decades. So the book tonight is Fire and Flood, A People's History of Climate Change from 1979 to the Present, which tells the story of the last several decades taking into account the reality of climate change itself, the scientific consensus about climate change, public opinion and political will, and business and finance, and the ways money climate deniers have been slowing and even reversing the pro progress of our collective awakening. So I'm going to pass the stage to our authors at this point. Thank you everyone so much for being here. Audience members, do not be shy in the chat um, or if you need anything, let me know. And with that, I'm going to pass this off to you two. Welcome. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Thanks to be here. Very glad to be here. Um, and thanks for the chance to talk to Eugene about his book, uh, for people watching, I've, I've known him for a long time now, since I was like a young uh, science writer when he was sort of a wise voice in uh, climate reporting. And um, it's a real, it's a, I'm cheating. It's a luxury to get to talk to him. So this is my excuse to do this. So thanks for letting me. Um, I, I thought I would start just uh, give you the floor, Eugene, and sort of ask you, you know, about the book, uh, A People's History. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, like, why a, why did a people's history sort of, what's what's that all about? Well, uh, yes, I, I 
I'm not a scientist. I'm not a policymaker, but I am a longtime observer of climate change, and I've written about it since 1988. And I wanted to change the perspective from either of those uh, points of view to the broader point of view of why, <laughs> what's happened, what has not happened, and how did we get to our present situation? Um, the trigger for me doing this was that way back in 93, I wrote an article for Time Magazine called, uh, 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 that had to do with the insurance industry and climate change. And back then I thought that the insurance industry was going to turn out to be the white knight of climate change because they were well aware of the risk, the reinsurance side of the industry, the side that insures catastrophic risks. And I thought it would show up in pricing and then people would begin an orderly shift away from the zones that were most at risk for climate damage just because the prices for insurance would go up in those areas. That didn't happen. Uh, they turned out to be a very timid night. And then a couple of years ago, um, when the campfire did $12.5 billion damage um, in uh, Northern California, uh, I was reading in the New York Times and uh, uh, the senior lobbyist for the insurance industry was quoted as saying that insurers were scrambling to figure out this climate risk. This is 25 years after <laughs> I had envisioned them as a white knight. And I, I said, what's wrong with this picture? Because They've known about the issue forever. And why hasn't, why didn't they act when they could have? Why didn't they do the things I expected them to do, which was to lobby Congress, which is to, uh, through pricing, um, pass on the risk of climate change and stop insuring coal-fired power plants. No, they didn't do any of those things. And the, the reason they didn't points to one of the reasons that we haven't taken any action in the last 30 years. Um, and that is that the incentive at the business end, the retail end of the insurance industry is to keep writing policies because there's yearly renewals for most policies. So the industry assumes that if things go bad, they can get out. And then secondly, um, their bonuses and profit sharing are based on past performance, not on <laughs> prospective performance. And so the incentive is to continue to write policies. And I underestimated their ingenuity at, at passing on and offloading and uh, spreading risk. Um, and we can talk about that later, but uh, that, that came in after a, a catastrophic Hurricane Andrew in uh, 1992 in Miami. But in any case, um, that was the trigger for me for, for, for why I wrote the book. And it's understandable you would have that feeling though. I mean, we both had to write these stories about Swiss RE and the other reinsurance right. guys continually putting out reports saying like, this is real folks. And yet there was no muscle behind uh, the, the reinsurers that was sort of noise into the wind at that time. Well, what, what happened, um, and this has to do with the insurance industry ingenuity. In 1992, that Hurricane Andrew put about a dozen insurers out of business, uh, put Lloyd's a famous uh, longstanding insurer on its knees. Um, and um, afterward, um, the, uh, Hanover Ray, which is another big reinsurance uh, giant, a guy named Everhard Muller came up with this idea, which he called a cat bond. And what a cat bond is, is investors can invest in this bond and say it's a hundred million dollar bond, they can take a piece of it, right? And you're betting that there will not be a category five hurricane in Miami in the next three years. So think about that. For the investor, even if the risk for a catastrophic hurricane is doubled from one in 100 to one in 50, it's still only a one in 50 chance in the next three years that you're gonna have a hurricane. If you don't have a hurricane, these bonds pay a very high interest rate. And they also appeal to the uh, investing in institutional investors because they're what's called non-correlated. In other words, that bond will pay off regardless of what happens in the markets, regardless of what happens with interest rates. And so in institutional investors particularly love non-correlated uh, invest investments. What that did for the insurance agents, uh, re reinsurance side, was it allowed them to offload a lot of that catastrophic risk. So that's one thing that happened. The second thing that happened is they did pull out of a lot of areas. For instance, a lot of big insurers pulled out of wind insurance in Florida. What happened then? The state picked it up. Right. The same thing, of course, is happening in California with the FAIR program. And so in both cases, when private insurers backed out of the risks, um, the uh, 
They stuck us. The with state them. socialized the risk, and 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 it, it, the irony is terrific because the coasts, of course, are the most eighty percent of the insured uh, value of uh, Florida property is on the coast. But who's going to be ultimately responsible for the risk? Those that live in the middle of the state, in other words, the taxpayers. So, and that also led to underpricing the risk. The consequence of all these things has been that millions of people have moved into the fire zones of the West, have moved into the exposed coastal areas in Florida and South Carolina and other areas. Um, and it basically because of the incentive, which is the underpricing of the insurance policies. And that has set the stage for a major financial crisis down the road as these risks begin to become expressed. Now, now, before people think this is just a history of the insurance industry, um, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you more about sort of how you structured that story. Um, you don't, in fact, just tell like this one story of finance. You have these four clocks that right. are running, you know, throughout the history that you're presenting here. Um, I hope I don't get them wrong. There's reality. Uh, there's the world of science. There's the world of public opinion. And then there's the world of business and finance. And they, the, the point is they don't run in sync. Reality is out of sync with all of the others. And that's sort of part of what's contributed to our catastrophe. Or how do you see it? Like, why did you set up those four clocks running in your book? Well, for, the, for precisely the reasons you just described, they do run at different times. Reality, of course, is the baseline. It's actually what happened. I'll go back, to, I'll tick them off first and then go back. Um, the second, of course, is the, the world of science. And they were in the position, uh, climate scientists were in the position of trying to understand climate change, even as it is happening. And they have a structural lag to reality just because you have to gather data, you have to analyze it, peer review it, and then publish it. So they're always going to be a couple of years behind what is actually happening. The public, of course, is getting its information, not directly from the scientists, and, uh, but through the media and all the other sources that they have access to. And the public has been literally decades behind the scientists in understanding this risk. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, 45% of people polled by Gallup said they did not expect any serious impacts of climate change in their lifetimes. This is even as climate change is seriously impacting a lot of lives. Um, and so they're decades behind this because that even in the 1990s, um, even 1979, um, Jimmy Carter had a blue ribbon panel convened on climate change. And that report uh, as said that unless we take action on fossil fuel emissions, uh, we will see changes in climate by the end of uh, the, the millennium, the, uh, by the end of two, uh, by 2000, it, actually they were uh, 15 years off. The changes started appearing in the late, in the mid eighties. Um, and then of course the uh, fourth clock, the uh, business and finance is the most important of all because at, for the first 30 years of the uh, climate era, which I date to 1988, um, and I'll explain why later, um, the world of business and finance has essentially been a drag anchor on on any action on climate. They saw climate regula change regulations as a threat to profits. They didn't see climate change as a threat. And uh, the fossil fuel industry, of course, was driving the chain, but the US Chamber of Commerce and other major uh, non-fossil fuel entities, uh, corporations were also involved in delaying action on climate change. And they were extraordinarily effective about it. And they used the playbook um, that was perfected, whether well, it was developed to de prevent regulation of tobacco, um, it was developed further in trying to stop regulation of ozone damaging chemicals in the 70s and 80s. And, and then um, I, I, in the early 90s, they didn't just mobilize to stop action on climate change. It was a blitzkrieg. And my perfect example of that is what happened with the Bush the Elder, poor George H.W. Bush, who some of you may recall ran in 1988 as he was going to be the environmental president. And he famously said, uh, those of you who worry about the greenhouse effect should consider the White House effect. And he promised to have a conference on climate change as the first order of business when he got elected. Well, sometime between when he was running for president and when he became president, the lobbyist effect came into play. And um, he did have this conference on climate change, but, no one was allowed to mention the word phrase global warming. It was like having a conference on pandemics and not being able to talk about COVID. And that showed the power of the business lobby for delaying action. So in the book, I basically say the battle was lost in the early nineties because we could have made, taken decisions then, we could have um, um, 
gotten China on board and India on board instead of letting them go alone without being part of any agreement to control emissions. Consequently, they went from, went from being causing half of the emissions that we did to twice the emissions that we do. Um, and they are the, by far the biggest emitters in the world and have been for some years. We could have done a lot of things, but back then, everybody was saying, we have time. Uh, even the IPCC, that massive consortium of scientists and policymakers, felt that in, the, in its earliest report in 1990, that the thermal inertia of the oceans would delay any sort of temperature raises to well into the next century. So back when we did, we, we thought we had time, but we didn't. Now we know we don't have time. And we also know that we're dangerously close to a lot of tipping points at which, to, at which point climate change will get out of control. The IPCC is, is in the news just in the last week. They had their third report of their sixth series of reports. Uh, and I, it's already probably been forgotten. Uh, it only came uh, last Monday. Um, you in the book are critical. You know, the IPCC is often seen as a as a uh, scientific uh, champion, as a uh, thing pushing forward. Uh, you know, uh, the co the case for uh, being aware of climate change. But in the, in the book, you write about it actually as an anchor around the around the whole process. And could I wonder if you could go into that a little bit, just since IPCC Ab is in the news right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well. It, I, I should say the ICCC was not helpful in its reports uh, for the basically the first 15 years of its life. More recently, you know, uh, it, it has really tried to portray the seriousness of the, of, of the threat without any ambiguity whatsoever. And this most recent report, of course, is an example of that. Yeah. But the problem was at the beginning was that it wasn't just scientists. There were policymakers and government representatives also involved from every country on earth, including countries like Saudi Arabia. The last thing they wanted was action on climate change. And those who would delay action saw innumerable opportunities to muddy the message coming out of the IPCC, not in the chapters, which are massive, uh, but in the uh, uh, summaries for uh, the, the summaries for uh, policymakers at the beginning, which are only you know uh, 50 to 100 pages. And that's the only thing that policymakers outside of the structure ever read anyway. Um, and what they did was they, you know, they, at every point, you know, they exploited the natural tendency of scientists to not want to go beyond the data uh, to say, you know, this needs further study, that needs further study. We don't have the data on the, this is 1990, we don't have the data on the permafrost because there's no research stations up there. And so it's not even mentioned, even though that is one of the biggest problems around today. Um, and this continued um, on, Right up in, in 2007, in the uh, fourth assessment, this major assessment, um, they didn't include data on the melting of the ice sheets um, because they were the result of semi-empirical studies. They didn't want to use those models. They didn't want to use the models. At the point they were not considering that data, melting of the ice sheets was already 40% of observed sea level rise. So in other words, they, they, they were not helpful at first. Um, and. Uh, but then, I think since then, there was such a backlash to that report by the scientists themselves, by the way, um, that subsequently they, the, these reports have uh, uh, caught up to uh, reality, so to speak. Right. And so you know, we're, you know, I was asking, I do want to ask you why you started 1979, why this is part of your book. But, but before I go too much further back into history as well, like, when you say uh, we blew it in 1990s, you know, that was where the mistake was made. You're not saying like it can't be fixed. It just sounds like by the end of the book, you're saying it's going to cost a hell of a lot more than it would have if we fixed it in, in, in that time period. Or how do you see that? No, well, exactly. Well, think about what's happened since 1990. Um, there were 5.3 billion people on the planet back then. There's 7.8 billion now. That's 2.5 billion additional people. Yeah. The average... Um, <clears throat> Greenhouse gas emissions per person per capita globally is for about four to five tons. That's 10 billion tons that we have to take out now, even to get back to 1990 levels, where we're already a problem in 1990. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, it was it was an issue, and um, what the delaying to this point just means that the rock is that much bigger that we have to push up that much steeper a hill. Um, I can go on if you like, but because let, let me go on a little bit because uh, I'll, it frames why I say we have to act now. 
And Guterres, the head of the UN, was also saying that. Um, even if every nation on earth abided by the terms of the Paris Agreement, temperatures in 2100 would be between eight degrees and 10 or 11 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they are now globally. The last time temperatures were that high globally was more than 2.7 million years ago. And it was before the ice ages began. Um, it was long before humans evolved. There were no people back then, there was plenty of life. Um, and it is seriously open to question whether uh, um, a climate that warm, that hot, um, could support the 7.8 billion alive today, much less the couple of billion that are gonna be added between now and then. And so that's the point is we cannot let that happen. And, but to not let that happen, having squandered 30 years of inaction, um, we have that much harder a, a road to hoe. There is a path out of this, but it, it gets narrower with every year. Now, in the book, um, especially in the, the clock set for business, uh, and it's surprising maybe for a person who worked in venture capital, uh, you <laughs> invite uh, our economic model. I mean, the, the, the insurance, you know, should have, you know, told the capitalists like, hey, well, look out, fellas, you know, I'm going to price you out of business if you, you don't fix this. But they didn't do that. There's a there's a short term kind of uh, greedy mechanism, you know, the that quarter to quarter lo outlook instead of a decade to decade outlook that sort of infects the way we live now. That you you, as I read your book, is your central you know villain here. Like, uh, the, well, it, it, it's the reason it's the reason we haven't done anything because what we what I, we discover is that there's just unbelievable momentum to business as usual. Right. That um, those who actually contribute to profits tend to get the attention of corporate masters and boards and everything else. Those who don't tend to get marginalized ultimately. And so what it leaves us with is essential, uh, essentially a system that is blind to long-term threats. That is no way of integrating um, long-term into the, because the short-term is driving everything, the quarterly profits, et cetera. Um, and so we've essentially created an economic system that is designed to drive off cliffs. And uh, this is a major cliff and we're heading right for it. And so I, I do think that we will some ways have to represent this long-term threat either through regulation um, or, or maybe through, uh, I, I propose a uh, universal tariff um, that it, to get the attention of the business community um, to adjust to, this, to the need um, to change the way in which our energy um, and transportation system is fueled. And, um, you know, I think if we don't wean ourselves from fossil fuels, the planet may, wean it, may well wean itself from us. So, I mean, this is not a, uh, it, it's not a, a, a theoretical exercise. This is where we're headed and we can't do it. And that means we do have to change the way we do business. Doesn't mean we have to have lower our standards of living, by the way. It just means we have to, uh, we can talk about this a little later. Very good. Um, one of the things that I also liked about the book, because I it, it spoke to me, was you know there's a sense throughout it of the, of the history of your own surprise that there isn't actions taken that you you did expect you know the grownups in the room to happen. I I know when I was writing climate stories for USA Today, it was clear to me as I was typing these you know the scientists were so clearly worried and uh, the the calls to do nothing you know in order to keep making money were so patently obviously greedy. I sort of expected some grown-ups, I would expect the readers to sort of, you know, evaluate these arguments and just say, oh my God, we got to do something. And it never happened. You know, I wrote front page stories for the paper and you, I know you wrote similar stories for time. And um, what do you take away from, from that experience? Well, I, I think one of the problems uh, is a, a, number of, a number of issues here. One is that there, there hasn't been a lack of information. Right. I mean, uh, you've been writing stories, I've been writing stories, lots of people have been writing stories. 26 Congress of parties, you know, uh, all covered in the media. Um, the uh, specials on TV, um, movies like Inconvenient Truth. I mean, the saturation, uh, you know, the information has been there all along. That's not the problem. The public is not engaged. Now, why, why aren't they engaged? Um, the, uh, uh, one of the problems is in the late 90s, the uh, issue became politicized. Right. And, and once an, an issue becomes politicized, the facts don't matter. If the messenger is deemed to be illegitimate, then you're not gonna listen to him. And we see have a perfect example of that with COVID. 
which became politicized almost immediately, and people are denying, denying of the disease and refusing to admit that it's real. So if somebody can refuse to admit that a virus is real, even as they're dying of it, they can also tune out any information that's coming in on a threat of climate change that seems to be decades in the future, even though it is not. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one of the major things. The other is that there still is a major problem of kind of illiteracy on the issue, which is surprising after all these years. A poll a couple of years ago asked uh, people, not regular people, um, what, is it, what is the major cause of climate change? And they gave a bunch of things. The most popular answer was uh, plastics in the ocean, which had nothing to do with climate change. And so the public isn't engaged. And we saw that in all these presidential elections. In the, well, let's start working backwards. Like 2020, 30 years, 34th, 32 years after the issue became a mainstream issue. Um, Inslee runs on climate change, goes nowhere. Tom Steyer runs on climate change, goes nowhere. Biden is in, in his debates with Trump. In, in one of the debates says, uh, you yeah, know, we're gonna end fracking in Pennsylvania. And Trump jumps and says, you've just lost Pennsylvania. And then his spinmeister go in a furious backpedaling afterwards saying, no, no, we didn't really mean it. And so if he can't really talk about action on climate, you know, in 2020, just, uh, you know, even after all these years, in 2004, Kerry did not run on the issue, barely mentioned it. 2000, Gore didn't run on the issue, having made his name on the issue. And the reason was the strata, their own strategists are saying voters aren't going to vote on this issue. And they've been proven, sadly, the strategists have been right. It just has not become a voting issue. Um, and that is one of the major reasons that we haven't taken any action. It's the politicians haven't felt the need to take action. And of course, a lot of them are getting a ton of money from the fossil fuel industry anyway. Uh, one reason we, the Biden administration has sort of backpedaled on a lot of the climate initiatives in um, their Build Back Better program is uh, because of Joe Manchin, the swing vote in the Senate, who uh, comes from the coal state and was a coal baron, right? So it just shows you how fragile this consensus is. Now, the public is aware of it. Oh, there's my cat in the background, sorry. He wants to join the conversation. Um, the public is aware and the issue public, the public that will act on the issue is getting bigger, but it hasn't reached that critical mass yet. Right. Um, and th that also complicates things when you refer to the polling and things like that, right? Because once an issue is politicized, these sorts of questions become a question of political identity in the polls, right? We found ourselves evaluating them. Like, are we asking people, you know, what do you think about global warming? Or are we really asking them, are you a Republican or a Democrat? When well, they, it, you know, it's it's hard to, it's it was hard for us. I don't know how you see the the public opinion question since you wrote a history. You know, it's one of your clocks. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, that same poll where I said forty five percent of Americans <clears throat> didn't see global warming as a threat in their lifetimes, the figure for Republicans was seventeen <coughs> percent. Only, <coughs> excuse me, saw it, <coughs> saw it as a threat. Sixty five percent of Democrats did. Yeah, it's it's uh, the issue of um, I'm, I'll let you finish getting your drink of water. I'm sorry. Um, there's a there's a whole school of thought like that. Um, you know, there's a there's a pollution of the public sphere. You know, in all scientific issues, and there's a lot of people holding their breath. You know, things mm. like GMOs, mm. uh, other uh, sort of scientific uh, synthetic biology, sort of in the <clears> offing, <throat> like hoping, oh my god, hoping we don't become politicized the way the climate change was. It's become sort of like <clears throat> a asset for being a science reporter, having to sort of, that's why I write about science and politics now, not just science, because it's they've, the two jobs have become like linked in a way they weren't hmm. probably in 1988 well, <clears throat> when you started doing this. The conception of your job was write about science, kid, not um, like you have to worry what John McCain thinks about it. <laughs> right. <clears throat> well, one of the problems is the media has changed since the 70s, 80s, and 90s till now. Um, the gatekeepers have gone away. And... You know, back in the 80s or even in the 90s, three major networks and then the public broadcasting um, <clears throat> and uh, a couple of dominant magazines, news magazines, um, and a few major newspapers. Now, with the web, there's this vast array of sources. And on the screen, they all look equally authoritative. And what's happened is it's well-defined um, um, processes, as we've become more partisan, we've also become more siloed. And so 
there are all these alternative streams of misinformation and disinformation that look equally authoritative. And without the gatekeepers, the intermediaries, the editors and the producers and things like that, a lot of information gets through to the public that would never get through in the earlier days. Yeah, those gatekeepers, I should say, weren't perfect. I had some crazy copy of editors course not. day to day who had some weird beliefs about things that we had to deal with, too. Uh, but it's true, you know, uh, the, the public that I, that I talk to, I don't, I don't know about your audience for the book, like they, there's people who are really, really, really well informed about one thing and they just want to talk to me about geoengineering. And then there's people who are just, you know, uh, interested in celebrities and this is just something they're reading on their way to the next Kardashian story. Uh, right. It's, it's become even harder to know as a science writer who to, who to write for. So I mean, sure. that's a long-winded way of asking you, like, who do you think, you know, is probably the best person for this book? Um, well, I, I would love to reach the people, um, you know, just the broad public. Um, because I think what I try to do here, I thought <clears throat> one of my motives is that you and I, uh, there's my grandkids and my great grandkids are going to be alive in 2100. Right. And they're going to crawl out of their caves and say, how is it that you guys blew it so badly? And I want to try and show <clears throat> what goes into 30 years of inaction. I mean, a, an alien landing on the planet would say, you knew about this for 30 years and you did nothing about it? Why not? You know, and it's, uh, it's really interesting. I, it, it, um, one of the, uh, going back to the media again, even though we had the intermediaries back in the 90s, there was another problem, and that, which I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with, and it's called both sidesism. Yeah. And um, where I remember a time we published something on climate change and got 600 identically worded messages, um, you know, saying this is all bull. Um, <clears throat> and um, we had to deal with it. And so the editors, you know, wanting to have a broad audience would always bend over backwards and go to uh, some paid shill you know, of the fossil fuel industry for the alternative opinion, which is sort of like going, when you're writing an article about the, the earth being round, going to somebody who says the earth is flat. At the point, the point at which we were doing that, the scientific consensus was absolutely rock solid. It wasn't that there was still debate about whether or not um, humans were forcing the, uh, uh, the changes in climate that we were seeing even in the 90s. But we still were sort of bending over backwards in the media to sort of allow these other voices to talk. And we saw that throughout. And, and there's the, uh, the, what people call the deniers have been incredibly skillful. Let's give you an example. Um, <clears throat> about 2008, 2009, um, there was all this talk about the pause in global warming. Right. You probably right. remember that. Very well. Well, there was no pause. What there was was that two, uh, 1998 was an extraordinarily warm year, broke the r record for the hottest year because of, I think of the El Nino back then was the strongest right. El Nino in about 100,000 years. And so subsequent years from that weren't quite as hot as 98. All those years but one for the next 10 years were in the 10 hottest years ever on record. But it looked on a chart, if you started in 98 and drew a a chart, it looked like there was a pause. Well, then there were reports on CBS Evening News about, uh, uh, there was one report, again, it was so sanctimonious, something like, well, there's a problem with uh, people who are advocating global warming that just doesn't seem to have been much more warming lately. Now, in order to write that report, the guy had to be completely ignorant of how, you know, of the temperature record, because certainly 10 top 10 years in the previous, or nine out of 10 top 10 years in the previous 10 years, suggests that there is a warming going on, but somehow they, they, they got through. So, and then of course you remember ClimateGate. Very well. um, Michael Mann, those email messages, they got totally twisted out of context and poor Michael Mann was hounded by the attorney general of Virginia um, over something even long after the, the issue had been settled and there wasn't any uh, machinations going on. Who later became a Trump immigration official. Uh, Cuccinelli, that, yes, right, yeah, he was their kind of guy. Um, yeah, the, the, I do wonder if that was part of the confusion people have. There's it, it, just like with the sort of illiteracy that you talk about for science in the public or the lack of knowledge. You know, mm -hmm. in in journalism, it's the same case. You know, it's it's not the math majors who end up writing a lot of the editorials. Uh, 
And he's saying, you know, right. I, the joke among science reporters at USA Today, at least, was that we were there to calculate percentages for the rest of the people when we had to figure out a tip. Um, <laughs> you know, that, so it was unusual. You had somebody who had, had calculus. And like that was not the people driving the, the opinion pages, you know, at places like ours and at other places. And this sort of uh, uh, technical obtuseness, you know, the, the famously the head of the Washington Post responding that he thought that it was your underarm deodorant was causing uh, the ozone hole uh, and, <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, sort of led people to despair. I, 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 well, I there, is a, you know. there is a, a, a the, the, that was a problem in the media as well. And I, I think that's being fixed today, but people would rotate into the science section who had no scientific background. And those are the most easily manipulable people there are. To give you an example of how enduring some of these things are, um, one of the big denier memes is that there have always been climate cycles. This is just another one. I, I did a show on uh, NPR show, Texas Public Radio today. That was one of my questions. Uh, don't you think this is just another climate? And my answer is, gee, don't you think the tens of thousands of climate scientists studying the issue would have thought of that? <laughs> you know, in other words, of course, that's the first thing they'd look for is whether it's possible that what is going on today is, is a repeat cycle of, uh, from orbital dynamics or some sort of interaction between the various pressure systems and the jet stream around the world that is, will revert to normal. But to ask that question is to assume that all these climate scientists are like dumb as stones and hadn't really thought of that. And, and yet it still gets asked 30 years after the issue has been settled. Science. Well, isn't that the point? You know, the, isn't to get the answer to the question, but to waste your time answering it instead of talking about uh, carbon tariffs or what needs to be done. There's this notion of the rhetorical staircase that you go like, well, how do you know it's real? Well, if it's real, do we really need to do about it? Um, okay, well, that's not going to work. Well, how do you know it's real? And you just keep on going up and down this rhetorical staircase and you never actually get to the <laughs> let's do something about it kind of point. Oh, absolutely. As, as long as you can say this is an issue for debate, which they still say. I mean, the public uh, in, in polling still, uh, many are unaware that the scientific consensus gelled in the 90s. Uh, many in the public still believe that there's a, an active scientific debate about whether humans are causing climate change. Yep. There isn't. It's not to say the consensus is always right. You know, the earth does rotate around the sun, not vice versa. Um, but um, this is about as robust a scientific consensus as we ever had. Moreover, if you just look around, you, it, you have to get very tortured to explain sea level rise as something, anything other than indicating that the planet is warming. Um, and yet people still try to do that. Um, and you have to, you know, five of the 10 worst fires in California history occurred in just one year. Um, that's abnormal and it's been mounting and steadily. So anybody paying attention can see that these, or even looking out the window, you know, spring is becoming earlier, fall is lasting later, winters. Uh, and, <clears throat> and then of course, I mean, one of the, some of the more interesting things are the ugly surprises, the things that weren't anticipated. For instance, um, the rapid intensification of storms going from category one hurricane to category five in 24 hours. That's a relatively new thing. Um, and it, I don't rec rec recall reading in the 90s that this was a, going to be a factor of climate change. The fact that storms are stalling for days and days and days and pouring 60 inches of rain on the suburbs of Houston, um, that has to do with the lack of uh, the, 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 the less temperature contrast between the Arctic and the uh, lower latitudes. It's actually slowed the jet stream and sort of had the consequence of meanders and kinks that tend to stay for longer periods of time. Um, but that also, this question of duration of storms, I don't remember reading about that. We read about more intense um, and more frequent. But there are all these artifacts, these second derivatives of climate change. They're not even second derivatives. They're probably first derivatives, but we, we just didn't anticipate them. And yet, large segments of the public can ignore it. Um, and, you know, we are where we are as a result. Um, yeah, I remember I found the, the one researcher who predicted derechos would get more intense. He was very, like, he was a Georgia Southern, you know, he was very proud of himself. Well, yeah, I, I did predict that. Like, you know, like, <laughs> um, I don't want to get- ever heard of the word derecho until, uh, yeah. until recently? I yeah. have. Uh, I, would, I don't want to give away the ending of your book, but, you know, 
just to talk a little bit more about the the four clocks, like uh, where where do you see them now? Are they still as out of sync as they ever were, or how how do you see things? Do you know they? Well, reality is reality, and unfortunately, reality, right, reality seems to be ahead of schedule, which yes. is unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, the scientific clock is, I mean, it, this is one of the great mobilizations of science in the history of the world. Um, and that's actually a, a good thing. I'll get back to that. Um, the, uh, the, the public is, is slowly becoming aware. And I think what's happening is uh, Wired just had a story on climate refugees. Uh, moving from the fire zones of California to New England, which is perceived to be a relative refuge from climate change, and actually the, the, there's some there's some there's some scientific backup to that, um, and and so I think prices are going to get the public's attention because these costs are real and they are going to get passed on to homeowners and taxpayers. Um, the uh, business community is in the very rapid change. It, um, I think in the last few years, major financial institutions and major corporations have realized that regu climate regulation isn't the threat, that climate change itself is the threat. That's nothing but good news. Um, and because money is flowing um, into, in, in, great, in great amounts into a lot of renewables and into a lot of innovation in that space. You know, I used COVID as a negative example. I'm not gonna now use it as a positive example because we got a COVID vaccine in a year. Um, the one before it took seven years and everybody expected that would be the case this time, but it shows what can happen when the world mobilizes. Um, it wasn't just us who developed it. It was the Europeans, it was the Chinese, it was everybody um, coming up with their own and, and in, in an extraordinarily rapid period of time. And I have a feeling that the uh, move away from fossil fuels and towards renewables has a momentum of, of its own. And as money flows in and the innovation increases in that sphere, that timeline is gonna go faster than perhaps we expect, it has to. I'll give you one example of that. Um, a guy named Sokolo at, at Princeton, you know, came up with the notion of wedges. The, yes. and other day, the, he, he said, these are the billion ton wedges that we have to come up with to take out of the atmosphere or to stop emissions in order to not have a catastrophic climate change. Well, he said, I, I interviewed him for the book, and he said that one thing he never expected was that EVs would become so popular so quickly. And one of the reasons they became, uh, the EVs are exploding around the world is battery technology. Why is, why, wh wh why, wh how did this battery technology come about? The most surprising answer is smartphones. Once smartphones took off, um, everybody started pouring money into how to have a longer lasting, smaller, more compact battery. The very kind of research that you needed to come up with a better battery for an EV. So what you can see is that sometimes you can actually exceed expectations. Um, there's one technology I'll mention that is not on the far future, but actually maybe only two years out from being deployable on a massive scale, and that's deep geothermal. Up until recently, you couldn't, it, there's basically infinite amounts of heat that could generate steam to run uh, turbines and electric power plants that's uh, five to 12 miles down. The problem has been that it's in very, very hard rock, uh, what's called basement rock, which is five to 10 times harder than sedimentary rock. So oil drillers can go through sedimentary rock, no problem. You couldn't get through the basement rock. Well, a, a, a group of uh, scientists and engineers <clears throat> out of MIT and the drilling industry formed a company to commercialize an MIT technology that um, was developed for fusion. Um, and it was what it, it to create these ultra high temperature plasmas that are used in fusion research. It's called millimeter wave beam technology, and it can melt the rock, um, vaporize it, not melt, vaporize. And as it vaporizes, it becomes vitrified and you forms the walls of a hole. So they claim that instead of taking years to develop deep, uh, drill down to deep geothermal, they can do it in a hundred days. Mm -hmm. They'll have a pilot plant up and running in Oregon next year. And they plan to have, this group plans to have two plants operational in 2024. 61% of American electricity is generated by steam turbines. Any one of those things, if could be retrofit, if this technology proves out, which if there are no technological hurdles, there are logistical hurdles drilling that deep. Um, <clears throat> it could produce power cheaper than any fossil fuel type 
we're talking about um, for retrofitting a half cent to one and a half cents per kilowatt hour, and also cheaper than any renewable. 75 to 80% of the world's electricity is produced by these steam turbines. Just imagine how quickly, if it's cost competitive, it's going to be deployed. So there are these things that could help us get out of this mess. That's been that's been proposed for things called geogrids in towns, right? That would uh, have different power stations around different sort of boreholes, essentially. Um, well, you can drill anywhere. That's the thing is you don't right. have to find a geothermal source because it's it's uniform around the globe. Right. Um, but I want to be careful. You're not a technological utopian. I don't get that sense. Like there has no, to be not at all. But I mean, we, you have to have the will to do it. Right. The point is, is that, you know, everybody is saying, um, you know, we've got to lower our standard of living. Well, one of the biggest technological movements of the last um, 20 years was from desk phones to the smartphones, essentially putting desk phones out of business almost. Um, there were, didn't produce a great depression as far as I can remember. Right. I mean, many of these technological transitions are seamless. So, I mean, we need the political will to do it, um, but it, it, it's not like eating spinach. I mean, one of the, the only benefits of COVID was that for the first time in their lifetimes, residents of New Delhi could see the Himalayas. They, um, they actually had clear air and they saw, gee, maybe life doesn't require that it be, you know, li live under a pall of pollution that shortens your life, um, you know, by 14.7 years, which I think is the number for New Delhi. Um, and, and so there are a lot of positive benefits from this shift as well. It is ongoing, um, but we, it has to speed up because um, we, it's not just zero, growth in emissions, we actually have to reduce emissions, <clears throat> you know, to uh, uh, prevent that scenario I mentioned at the beginning where the temperatures rise, you know, by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. But how optimistic are you, though, at this point, after doing this for so long? And we haven't done anything. Hearts? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, look, I've been expecting this forever and it hasn't happened. And it's very disheartening when, when the war in Ukraine causes all these people to say, well, we need more drilling. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is oil is expensive, not because of Ukraine. We import 3% of our oil from Russia. That's not, it's a rounding error. Um, <clears throat> it's because of the rebound from COVID, you know, where a lot of drilling stopped because oil demand dro dropped enormously. And then the economy restarted faster than the oil supply could keep up. Um, so, I mean, there are these, uh, it, you know, it is disheartening in 2022 so anytime anything happens where gas prices go up, people point their fingers at the environmentalists and say, see what you've done? This is the world they'll give you, you know, when it really doesn't have anything to do with that. Right. But it's the same guys pointing their finger, right? It's This isn't an accident. That we're, well, I, well, no, it isn't an accident. But yeah. I mean, it's really a smaller and smaller group of people. But it's just amazing that they still have traction. And one of the reasons they still have traction is the lack of public engagement. Who, are, uh, who aren't equipped to sort of say, you're wrong. You know, I mean, look at what happened in Texas when they had that freeze last year and uh, the governor and everybody else sort of said, look at these, we shifted the wind and this is what we got. When in fact, it was the natural gas infra right. infrastructure that froze. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's disheartening that the, those corrections, the correction to climate gate, the correction to uh, that kind of lunacy like it comes like three weeks later and you write it and you don't, you have the feeling like, you know, does anybody check this? You know, is anybody seeing that in fact that was bullshit? Um, right, right. <laughs> uh, it's hard as a reporter to have as much faith in the public sphere as I did when I started, I have to be honest. All right. Um, let's see, what part of your book haven't I asked you about that I should? I, I'm, I don't want to take all the time just asking, indulging my curiosity. No, 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 you, you, you basically covered most of the waterfront. Um, I think the uh, one of the signal changes, which you would know about, was that <clears throat> in the early days of the climate era, I mean, I, going back to, to the 80s, right. um, the general, the conventional wisdom was that climate change slowly and over great spans of time, maybe hundreds or thousands of years. And if that was the case, you really wouldn't worry that much, right? And then, of course, um, pioneers like Wally Broker, um, the great geophysicist who died a couple of years ago um, from Lamont Doherty, had been arguing that no, climate does not change in a slow and stately fashion. In fact, the past has been characterized by very rapid shifts. So then they, the reason 
the conventional wisdom didn't change beforehand was that the, they didn't have proxies that could reconstruct past climates with the degree of precision you needed to see those rapid changes. In other words, it, was, it wasn't that the record wasn't there, it was just we couldn't see it. And, and then they uh, did these deep drilling of ice cores, a European and American project, the, like third time around in Greenland, came up with two, di two different pro uh, ice core samples that all of a sudden showed that 12,000 years ago or so, uh, 12,800 years ago, climate froze in a matter of years, not decades, years at extreme levels. I mean, temperature drops of 20 degrees or more. Um, and then... 1500 years later came out of it with equal rapidity. In other words, they showed that climate was not a dial that you turned up gradually, but rather a switch. And that these rapid changes could come on very, very um, uh, unexpectedly. Um, now, that's profoundly important because most of the public still thinks that climate change is off in the future as that poll shows. Mm -hmm. um, and so can sort of say, I don't really have to pay attention. It's not gonna affect me. It's not gonna affect my children. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is we are in the midst of a rapid climate change event right now. Climate is changing very rapidly. The sea level is many times, like dozens of times faster, rising faster than it has in the last thousand years. Um, and I, I think the, 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 the most important thing in this book is that we, we've never, humanity has never had it so good as the Holocene, this last 10,000 years or so, where it is the sweet spot in every respect for growing human numbers from 5 million to 7.8 billion, billion, where agriculture flourished and everything else. And we take it for granted, but it is the context for all human activity. And if climate changes, everything changes. And I would like people to understand that the stakes, um, the gravity of the stakes, and maybe if they did, if the public understood that, we might get some um, that critical mass we need for action. Right. I mean, that that is the thing that alarms most of the scientists that I talk to and the science reporters themselves. Once you grasp this, the 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 drops of you know ten feet of sea level rise that they've seen in in you know the ice age records and that sort of thing, or the notion of when you do understand the masses of the Atlant uh, Antarctic ice sheets just collapsing you know, like what that would do, like that, that's beyond biblical stuff. And, and yet it's, it's not in people's minds the way it should be. I mean, there've been pieces about it, but we have, for some reason, just can't hammer it into, into people's heads. Like this is a real thing we're, we're rolling the dice on here. You know, it's going to happen. Well, it will, it would be helpful if a couple of, uh, because of this uh, partisan and politicized issue, if a couple of leading Republicans got on board. Right. Yes, I mean that to to actually get it uh, out of this partisan um, divide would be one of the most helpful things that would, could possibly happen. Right. That's yeah. That's a point that Dan Kahan at Yale has made. You've, I'm sure you've right. interviewed that people listen to their friends. They listen to, to Rush Limbaugh. They listen to their political leaders. The, the, we're way down on the list of like people who change their minds. Right. Um, you know, next to your best best friend at the bowling alley. <laughs> Looks like you might have a, a question from the audience. I'm sorry I've been hogging all the time. I hope I haven't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, this has been wonderful. Um, we, we have a few minutes left uh, for some questions. So audience members, now is the time. If you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A. Um, for now, we have a question from Colleen, which says, in Eugene's research, uh, what in Eugene's research gives him hope? How about in Dan's? Well, I... Uh, I, I just mentioned one of them, um, which is that the potential for a massive shift of power generation, you know, to uh, deep thermal power, that that's it's not pie in the sky. Um, and it, we're talking about terawatts of power. And it actually you could that that could reduce fossil fuel emissions dramatically in and of itself. And there's a hell of a lot of other things out there. That are actually being tried right now. In other words, combining carbon dioxide with calcium to make synthetic limestone, which could be used in making concrete, which for making of concrete and using of concrete uh, accounts for a lot of a high percentage of emissions, or using um, iron oxide and uh, running electric current through it to create coal. Uh, Two billion tons of coal a year takes it accounts for eight percent of emissions. You could do zero carbon in that. You're bringing so there are these things that can happen. They give me hope. Um, 
I'll turn it over to Dan. You know, you know what actually gave me some hope on Friday. I had to. I drove in my uh, my rental car, my fuel efficient rental car, from a, a story I was writing in West Virginia on uh, the overdose crisis, uh, home on the highway. And I it struck me a uh, whole way home on the highway. I saw one piece of litter on the highway on I eighty one and I sixty four West Virginia back to DC. And I remembered when I was a kid driving that same route, the highway was lined with garbage, you know, right. the whole way along the side of the road. And that changed, you know, like that doesn't happen anymore. <clears throat> so like the public, when it can gets an idea, like that's, you know, you're a grotesque person if you throw a beer can out your window, you know, even in Charleston, West Virginia, if that can change there, you know, public, the public opinions can change in a way that's better for the environment. So, I mean, I was thinking about that. I was like, what am I going to ask Eugene? That was sort of like a, a thing that made me a little hopeful going. And the other thing I'd say is like the price of solar cells, solar powers dropped amazingly, you know, and it, and it looks like that's going to keep happening. And I mean, money talks in our society. And so when it becomes a lot cheaper to get money from the sun or get power from the sun and money that is power, you know, that matters. That, that, that I mean, coal is done for economically. It's a zombie. The, the people talking any other way about it don't know what they're saying. Exactly. I think she's on mute. I'm muted, but I'm not anymore. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so we have just a couple more minutes. Um, I'm going to ask, what is next from each of you? Where should we look out if we want to follow your work? Oh, my work? Both of you. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean. You're than me, man. <laughs> right now I'm, I'm, I'm working on this and, um, <clears throat> and, uh, I'm also, uh, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm writing a lot of ancillary things around this, about this issue, um, and trying to put them out there. Um, you know, it is the issue of our age. Um, and, uh, you know, it is, it is a dream, um, that, it finally gains traction with the public. Um, and uh, I've been beating my head against the wall trying to find ways to get traction with the public for, throughout my career. That's why I wrote Winds of Change, trying to say, well, gee, if natural climate change could bring down civilizations, maybe it'll make people wonder about what we're doing to ourselves right now. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and and I do think that um, we, we are on the on the cusp of uh, uh, of dramatic change um, in public attitudes, just through the pricing and all these very and nature itself, and the signals coming from nature itself, um, and uh, it better happen. That's all I can say. I'm I'm pretty easy to find. I'm at uh, BuzzFeed.com. Look at BuzzFeed News, Vergano. I I actually do more editing than actually writing about climate change these days, but uh, the. Um, the one thing I will say is that there's a hell of a lot of hiring going on in, our, in the science reporting business for yeah. climate change right now. So, you know, you should expect, you should demand just in general, more climate reporting. The, the bigger outlets are hiring a lot of people and the smaller outlets too. Uh, and it's a focus at, at BuzzFeed News. Um, our science desk is shifting around a little bit. We're having the usual spelkus uh, in the business, but, you know, it's obviously going to continue to be a focus there. And, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm, the, the only thing I would say that's good about climate change is for science reporters, it is a kind of uh, uh, career uh, guarantee because they're going to need somebody to write about this for sure for for a long time. Not, I'd rather write about something else, but you know, we're kind of stuck. You know. All right. Well, with that, I think it's about time to call it a night. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. This has been such a wonderful conversation. For anyone who'd like to get your hands on copies of Fire and Flood, it is in the chat. Go ahead and follow those links over to the website. Um, let us know, audience, of course, what you thought of this event in person or on social media. We always, always, always love to hear from you. Eugene and Dan, huge thank you for being here tonight. This has been so wonderful. Um, do you have any last words you'd like to share with us before we say good evening oh it's been fun i've enjoyed the conversation with dan and thank you very much for the opportunity thanks for letting me get a chance to, to talk to eugene uh the, you know the, the, usually i had to sneak him on the phone back in the good old days so this has been a really nice thing thanks everybody for listening. likewise thanks <laughs>
Well, it's been our pleasure. So thank you both so much. And with that, I think it's time to do the awkward waving thing. So good night, everyone. One more huge <laughs> thank you. Good night, Dennis and Colleen. Oh, Dennis. Hey, Dennis. Take care, man. <laughs> he's, a, he's a natural geographic guy. Good to see you. Uh. Take care, man. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you.